Destin Vasili. The title still felt sharp on his broad tongue, a title he had been working towards for decades, one which few achieve, even among the pure-blooded elites of the Sons of Baal. His success had proven the strength of his blood, of the gift of Blibal, expressed through his flesh and his soul. Vasili had never been loud or brazen in his devotion to the goddess, unlike some of the elders, now his brothers and equals. He prayed relatively briefly, yet unfailingly, each day, in thanks for his elevated concentration of the divine blood, as assessed by the rituals of his order. That gift, along with countless long days of training, which would have broken most mortals, had helped him to accomplish many missions, and finally to ascend from a Finlord monitor to his new title. Now came the opportunity for an even greater gift, though, once again, the gift would be worth nothing without faith, without, in all likelihood, years of brutal labors, and without the adamant will to suffer through whatever it took to attain his goal. Vasili's shoulders ached in anticipation of what was to come, but first, a decision. Godfin Jokaza swam down the shaft ahead of him, her strokes elegant and silent, virtually without turbulence, despite the lack of webbing between her long fingers and toes. It made Vasili keenly aware of his own thin, almost skeletal fingers. The pain of the Lugo Kwa did not last, but the pride did. The hours-long ordeal had begun by ritually, roughly, slicing away the webbing that aids Kua in their swimming. That pain was sharp, sudden, but quickly faded to a dull ache of loss, for the body was aware that it could survive such damage. It could continue to feed, fight, and reproduce. What followed was a constant tearing and burning pain as the priest moved their implements with torturous precision around his feet and then his hands, scouring the remaining tissue, blood vessels, and nerve endings along every contour of the fresh wounds, a form of pain the body would never experience in normal life, a form of pain the body was not prepared for, but Vasili, who was no masochist by any means, had almost savored it. The blades which burned away his former weakness seared that pain onto his will and into his memory, the blades left no scars. They felt like victory. Now he found his own swimming to be a little slow and awkward. He had read the tracks on how to swim after the ritual, without webbing, but knowledge means little without practice, so no doubt he would have to work a little harder for months, perhaps years, in that one regard. In the meantime, he had strength and endurance to spare. But for now, he had but to follow at a sedate pace behind the godfin's translucent yellow-gold head fins. The pair swam up to the underwater door of the fourth dojo, one of the spaces reserved by the Sons of Baal for the use of their death fins. A pair of fin monitors flanked the door as an honor guard. At a nod from the godfin, they each turned and depressed particular tiles of the wall mosaic's holy imagery, unlocking a hidden latch in the stone of the ceiling, which Jokaza pushed up and aside. She and the new deathfin swam up there, and, as one of the honor guards pulled the stone cover closed behind them, the pair emerged from the water into the damp, still, seldom-breathed air of a secluded spiral stair. This is a holy place, thought Vasili, as they climbed many dozens of stairs upward, opening the old door of carven whale skull into a chamber which had been excavated beneath the surface buildings of the monastery, but which was not attached to them, save for some tiny, cleverly concealed tubular air shafts. The vault of the sacred scrolls of the sons of Baal. This place contained perhaps the most hallowed texts in all the empire, save for the sepulchre of storms, which House Valoon maintained beneath the imperial palace. True, this vault did not contain a true tooth of Blibal, but unlike the sepulchre's library, the comparatively tiny amount of paper and ancient vellum within this space 
held the keys to powers the priesthood could only dream of. Here, one who had the intellect, the strength, and most of all, the will, could unlock immeasurable secrets. The godfin's translucent yellow fins, in sets of three, betrayed her origins from the spawning pools of House Valoon, that ruling house which made up most of the priesthood, and who effectively selected the emperors themselves. Many of the sons of Baal came from Valoon, for of all the houses, that one best understood the importance of purity of the divine blood which all Kua carried within them. But once inducted into the ranks of a monastery, house ties were broken. All here were sons of Baal, who would never share what lay within this space. Even the emperor himself could not command them to. Now, Jokaza said only one word. By tradition, the only word spoken by Godfins within this chamber. Choose. Fazali bowed to her. A shallow bow, for he had earned the right to be here. None would deny that. Then he turned to the vault and began shuffling down the aisles, as she turned and left, sealing the door behind her. Each Kua monastery had a similar vault, though there was no way to know what the others looked like. It was said that no Kua, not even the infamous Godfin Shuazul, had ever seen more than one. Not counting, obviously, those sent to destroy the heretic scrolls of Shuazul's Shadowfin monastery after his uprising failed. This vault, buried within Drunbuta, the Isle of Wisdom, had rows of down-slanted services carved out of the solid stone walls. The angled top of each was either blank, leaving space for future generations of death fins, or else had a couple lines of writing hand-chiseled into it. Each contained a drawer which opened downward at the same angle. Vasili took it in slowly, as he examined each in turn, looking from the right side to the left and back. Those nearest the entrance were so ancient that they were labeled in the first Kuar script, triangular runes rather than the modern alphabet. In fact, the very first on the left, containing the scroll of Kugo the Beast, was so old that the carven runes still had the third side, encasing each logogram within a full triangle, whereas even the writers of that time had almost immediately begun to leave off the third side. If each rune had the top left and bottom of the triangle, that was enough to easily separate them. The other original monastery, Diamond Reef, claimed otherwise. But Kugo's was quite possibly the very first death fin scroll ever recorded, the progenitor of this tradition for passing down one's secrets to ensure the future of the order. But Kugo's was not the scroll which Vasili sought. He passed row after row of these shelves, the legacy of generations. The techniques they each contained were as dangerous as they were powerful. No monitor could train with every scroll, let alone master them. Even after the godfins had restricted them to death fins alone, still some powerful warriors had died, or lost their minds, trying to follow the instructions of one scroll or another. Many had tried and failed to unlock a scroll's power, and in fact, as many as a third of these secret techniques had never been fully mastered except by their original creator. The originator of any particular power might not have understood it well enough to convey what they had done in a reproducible manner, or they may have lied, giving false instructions to take their secret to the grave, a triumph of narcissism. And the sons of Baal understood better than any that some powers granted by Blabal were a factor of the individual's blood, miracles which could not be trained. He took his time, giving each label the reverence it was due. The writing changed down the aisle, as it had changed over the centuries, as successive generations of Godfin chiseled the runes or letters. Some had perfectly precise writing, others had clearly never written in stone before, 
leaving the markings dangerously shallow, or even cutting a mistake into the hallowed slabs, a mistake which would live on as long as the sons of Baal order itself. But finally, Vasili found that which he sought. The thirty-degree slant of the shelf bore neat lettering, looking almost modern to his eye, though he knew it to be fourteen centuries old. It read, Death in Zial, Scroll of the Short Strike. Vasili chuckled, not for the first time, at Zial's dry sense of humor. The creator of a scroll had the honor of naming it, naming their technique for the ages. Scroll of the Short Strike. Zial the Dragon Slayer's might had been legendary. The haughty and arrogant dragons themselves had feared him. He may have done more to deter the advances of the dragon lords than any other single Kua, and the dragons had very long memories. Popular legends said he had slain a great worm in a single punch. The truth was that conflated two different victories. The annals of the Finn lords recorded that Zial, in a single punch, had defeated an adult dragon, considerably younger, smaller, and less apocalyptically dangerous than a great worm which had lived since the dawn of mortals. That dragon had survived the short strike, at least long enough for Zial to walk over and break its neck as it lay helpless on the ground. The great worm Zial had fought was a different story. That dragon had survived, but even it had been driven off, forced to fly away while the monitor was still standing. Vasili turned the handle, not a lock, just a simple latch, and slid the drawer slowly downward. Scent was not one of the keener senses of the Kua, particularly out of the water, but he could smell the age of the paper. This particular scroll was not curled, but was made up of seven sheets laid flat on a bronze tablet, with removable one-piece metal prongs on both sides, top and bottom, holding the papers in place. There was no magic in these papers. Their power lay in the knowledge they held. Vasili began to read the introduction, his pulse racing, thumping in his veins, but there was something off. He paused in his reading. Though he could now return here as often as he liked, he intended to memorize the scroll over the next few hours. But he had a strange feeling, a tug on his mind. He tried to read again, but Zial's elegant words seemed to roll off his eyes. He realized he had read the same sentence three times in a row without taking it in. He had no idea what was distracting him from his goal, but after another few minutes of trying, he slid the drawer back up, turning the handle closed, and began to wander aimlessly further into the vault. Reaching the end of the long row, he turned right, rounding the corner to the next of the parallel aisles, where his eye was drawn to one of the first drawers beside him. Deathfin Uvira. That monitor did not immediately spring to mind for him. The next line read, Scroll of Heavenly Grasp. Vasili's eyes widened. He was not familiar with Uvira, but every monitor knew of the Scroll of Heavenly Grasp, for it had been wielded by Deathfin Tarum, one of the four who had defeated the heretic tyrant, the infamous Godfin Shuazul, third most powerful monitor to have ever lived, when he tried to topple the entire empire. Tarun's style was quite dissimilar from that of Vasili. It was not something he had considered, and frankly, Tarun hardly seemed to have been the strongest of the four, who, contrary to the rule of one monitor, one mission, had been forced to work together to have the slightest chance of stopping Shuazul. But standing here, it was impossible not to at least take a glimpse. This drawer contained a more traditional scroll, rolled up to fit into three loose copper rings. Vasili slid them off, carefully unfurling the contents. This one was only three pages. They were in good shape relative to their age, but his newly webless fingers could still feel the brittleness. He took in the introduction, comparing it to what he knew of Tarun's most famous battle. The history of it was overwhelming, brought a grin to his wide, toothy mouth, 
but skimming quickly over the exercises, the training Uvira claimed had allowed her to discover this power. He shook his head, disappointed. Sounded like nonsense, like a wild octopus chase. Though Tarun had famously learned his power from this scroll, this one, at least, was proven. But no, this was not what he had come for. He re-rolled the pages with all the reverence due to their originator and to her illustrious successor, but this scroll was not for him. He replaced the three metal rings and placed the item back in the drawer, but as he began to push it closed, Vasili was overcome by a sudden coughing fit. He doubled over, not in what he would call pain, but it was an overwhelming gag reflex mixed with an emptiness of his air lungs. He had the presence of mind to release the drawer and stumble back away from it, but he was completely overcome long enough to be left wheezing until he hacked up some fluid. Only when he violently coughed it out was he finally able to catch his breath, though he still felt disoriented for a moment. He had an urge to get his gills under water, as though the air had betrayed him. But after a minute, the feeling passed. As he regained his bearings, he saw a splatter of blood on Ivira's slab. He had coughed up one big red watery blob of it, which was starting to drip down the thirty-degree angle toward the open stone drawer. The only time Vasili remembered ever having coughed up blood was after fighting that spear-wielding stormfin on the Illud side of the southern peaks of the Leviathan. Vasili had nearly died that day. He'd had such difficulty closing against the spear monitor's reach that in the end he'd accepted a potentially lethal stab to his lower torso in order to get in killing range and win. The wound had bled so badly that he could not swim without worsening it, forcing him to drag himself back up the mountain without using his legs, one hand pulling him along the ground, the other clenched to his midsection, struggling to keep his guts in. In fact, he'd run out of blood sponges by the time he got halfway, after which his hemorrhaging into the ocean had attracted no less than three separate enemy shark riders to finish him off, had any one of them gone for his legs, floating limp behind him as he pulled himself through the water. He was convinced that kicking them would have torn him open, and he'd have died soon after. But each of the three Sahagrin had seen a wounded Deluvian and taken their mount in for the quick kill, head or throat, bringing them within reach of Vasili's deadly hands. Killing each of them was but a vague memory, whereas the pain and fatigue of dragging himself back to a friendly camp remained firmly lodged in his mind. He blinked, brought back to the present, and realized the drawer with the scroll of heavenly grasp still hung open, his own blood still streaking down towards it. Vasili, with his superhuman reflexes, shot a hand out to slide shut the drawer, but it was too late. A drop of blood pooling at the corner dripped down onto the scroll, even as he closed the compartment. Vasili was overcome with shame at the damage he had just caused to this ancient artifact. With a swipe of his broad tongue, he took back the rest of his blood, accepting the bitter dust of the vault as punishment, then reopened the drawer to inspect the damage. Looking at the splotch of his blood on the faded white of the scroll, he stopped, suddenly gazing downward in reverence, in the direction of Baal, the devourer, goddess of the Kuotoa. In that moment, it all became so clear. It was a sign. The scroll of heavenly grasp. If that is her will, then I will master this power. And he set to work. I hate this door. Years ago, when Vasili was chosen by the scroll of heavenly grasp, he had memorized its relatively brief philosophy and the instructions for mental, physical, and psionic exercises, which had been recorded by Deathfin Uvira, and presumably followed by Deathfin Terun. Then he had immediately sought out Uvira's door, the hallowed spot within the monastery where she had supposedly grasped the heavens. The godfin, knowing Vasili's admiration for Deathfin Zial and his power, had been a little surprised to learn of his choice within the vault, but when he had told her that Baal had guided him to it, she grabbed his shoulder firmly, nodding to acknowledge the privilege and the burden 
of being thus charged. Then she had shown him to the door. Uvira's door was found in the lower levels, beneath the terrestrial structure of the monastery. It was hard to get an exact sense of the relative location, but Vasili suspected it was not too terribly far from the hidden vault itself, though this hall was accessed from the surface temple rather than some secret entrance up from the underwater caverns. Godfin Jokaza led him to the end of the hallway, where a simple wooden door led to an old storage room but she pointed instead to the wall. Carved into that wall was an engraving of a simple arch. And that was all. No runes, no handle or other means of opening the door. Just two lines from the ground up, meeting in a semicircular curve, subtle enough that Vasili had not even noticed until his attention was drawn to it. What lies beyond this wall? Nothing but stone. This is the outer wall of the monastery, facing inland. I know of nothing out there except miles of Drunbruta's rock. But when Godfin Guluk chose me to be his successor, he told me that this spot was Uvira's door, and that this was part of the knowledge I must pass down to the next Godfin after me. What other knowledge did Guluk share with you? asked the newly promoted Deathfin mischievously stroking one of the short fleshy stalks that hung from the corners of his broad toothy mouth i will tell you if you are chosen to become godfin she grinned broadly like a shark then left vasili to his studies i think i will leave the teaching and the paperwork to you i will content myself with completing missions and learning the secret to passing through Uvira's door, he replied over his shoulder to her already departing back. His voice echoed dully from the dead end. Many years had passed since that conversation. Vasili had completed numerous missions, but each time he returned to Uvira's door. Uvira's blank, fake door. He had revisited the vault many times as well. Though he had memorized the text of the Scroll of Heavenly Grasp on his first visit, he returned to it nonetheless, looking for anything he might have missed, any code hidden among its letters, any subtle curve he might have missed in its diagrams, any possible secret hidden under the tiny dark stain of his own blood on the blank outer side of the last page. At this point, he could have reproduced the scroll near perfectly from memory. The only flaws would stem from hands practiced at killing, not at drawing. He had also searched the histories of the Order for any references to scrolls and to teleporting arts, and had spent days examining the handful of other Deathfin scrolls in the vault which had any connection to teleportation though he had no wish to risk messing up his training by pursuing mastery of more than one at a time he had found some slight insights he had also trained with the godfin and with deathfin okul to perfect his basic teleportation techniques to ensure that he was a true master of the finlord level martial and psionic instant movement abilities his scroll uvira's scroll contained a short suite of basic exercises and training katas which he had performed faithfully every day for all these years he believed he had uncovered at least one of the pillars of heaven described by the scroll's creator though even that was difficult to confirm without mastering the remaining two pillars but he would never be the equal of tarun unless he could learn to teleport within oneself and to pass through my door as Uvira put it. For the former, Vasili's current efforts were focused on trying to teleport himself as short a distance as possible. This was an extremely counterintuitive thing to do. Teleportation required you to magically touch the surface of the Astral Sea, which resembled a film of energy covering all the world, sea, land, and sky. A true teleport would push through that film, piercing reality, and allowing a being to transport themselves instantaneously to literally anywhere in the world, in effect defeating the concept of distance. 
that required not only great power, but the expenditure of a locus of the reality-twisting life energy contained by certain rare sea monsters and other terrible warped creatures. Rather than pierce the film of the astral, though, most monitors, including Vasili, were concerned more with what might be described as lesser teleportation, merely scraping that astral layer in order to jump relatively short distances without passing through the intervening space. Typically, monitors who used such abilities trained to initiate them as quickly as possible and to stretch that movement without motion as far as their psionic or arcane powers would allow. Vasili now trained to do the opposite, attempting to scratch that layer of reality as precisely as possible in order to disappear and reappear as a teleport, but without changing position. When first he tried, it had taken him over a month to find the trick to teleporting less than his usual ten-foot leap, because it was so counter to the decades he had spent honing that power, a power used to throw opponents off balance or to bypass small barriers. It had been merely an extra option in combat, something he had rarely even found useful in actual battle. Once he had succeeded in shifting his mindset, he had shortened his jaunts from ten feet to about half that with relative ease. But he soon ran into a metaphorical wall, where shaving off each additional tiny increment required dozens, even hundreds of attempts, weeks of practice, given the limited number of jumps that he could manage before having to rest his mind. He hit yet another wall, so to speak, when he got the distance down to nearly zero. Measured by chalk marks on the floor, he was able to teleport forward a single body length, with his heels ending up just in front of where his toes had been. To move any less would mean that his destination would partially overlap with his body's starting position, and that had proved incredibly difficult to do. Then there was the very literal wall he faced, every day in that goddess-forsaken tunnel. Okul had taken some glee in informing him that some of the Finns had begun referring to Vasili as the hallway man, not to his face, of course. That damn the door. Vasili had examined every inch of Uvira's so-called door. He had found no hidden messages, nor mechanisms, nor magic. It was a smooth, craftsmanly groove, cut half an inch deep in the wall, and it was nothing else. He had even managed to enlist the assistance of Finlord Kumitas. She had failed her first Deathfin trial seven years before, and bore a bit of a grudge toward the Godfin for requiring her trial mission to be completed without using her blood gift. But that, of course, was the purpose of a Deathfin trial, a mission that played to the Monitor's greatest weaknesses to ensure that only the most well-rounded warriors could become Deathfins. He suspected Kumitas would succeed in three years when she was eligible to try again. Failure, and being forced to wait, had proven powerful motivators for many of history's Deathfins, and possessing such a powerful gift would make her all the deadlier once, in the fullness of time, she mastered a Deathfin scroll for herself. In the meantime, though, he had convinced her to use her power to phase herself through the wall and search the other side for any secret cave or buried psionic crystal, anything. She found nothing but solid stone, and after searching some five hundred feet over two days, she snapped that failures have limits and returned to her own training. When teleportation meets a solid target, there is a conflict. All mystical arts that concern themselves with instantaneous movement had shaped their spells or powers in such a way as to ensure that such conflict did not result in the caster's body being fatally intermixed with the matter at the destination. Some teleport methods would simply fail if the destination was occupied, leaving the spellcaster where they had started. Others would shunt the caster to the nearest unoccupied space. The latter method was still risky, because the stress of that barely controlled redirection could be harmful. Exposure to the astral was meant to be extremely brief, and being shunted was much like being keel-hauled. 
dragged violently against that powerful, hidden layer of reality. But today, back in front of Uvira's mocking door, Vasili was experimenting again. With practiced ease, he focused his mind on the place that allowed him to touch the astral, borrowing the power of that dimension to teleport himself beyond the door. His body disappeared. In the next quantum of time, his body sought to reappear ten feet forward from where he'd started, but it could not. There was solid rock in that location, solid rock for fifty feet up and for thousands of feet in almost every other direction except backward, the astral energy which covered all of three-dimensional space like a film took hold of every part of him, thrusting him back the shortest possible distance to a space that was free of solid matter. The air particles filling that space protested, but were simply brushed aside, slightly compressing the rest of the air in the hall, though in this case there was no difference in pressure as the other air flooded into the sudden vacancy left in the position he had formerly occupied. Vasily's entire body felt pinched for a moment, like he was being stretched in a way which was not physical. It felt like several seconds of existential, life-threatening pain, but in what would have appeared to an observer to be no measurable time at all. Vasily had moved less than two feet, ending up with his flat snout virtually touching the wall, the door. He had not crossed the space between his old and new positions. In fact, according to wizards he had consulted, he had not touched that space eight feet behind the door, either. He stumbled back half a step, breathing heavily, though the pain faded almost instantly. It took about four seconds for his highly trained mind to reassert control of his autonomic functions, for his will to overrule the weakness of body, returning his heart rate and breathing to normal. He took another thirty seconds or so to compose himself, then slid backwards a little further along the cool stone floor to the same point where he had started, the same point from which he had attempted this exercise fifteen times already this week. Then he did it again. Again he was painfully ejected from the wall, ending up with his face right in front of Uvira's door. There was no momentum to the teleportation, such that the quartet of whisker-like tendrils hanging from his chin did not even wobble until he stepped away. But it was not the ground which had ejected him. It was the astral energy forcing him back to safety, tearing him from his original destination and thrusting him back out into the open. Many would call him a fool for continuing to push himself this way. What could he possibly achieve by banging his head against a wall? I have broken through walls before. As a Finn, an apprentice, Vasily's master had led him out to the forest on the southern half of the island and pointed to a tree. Scything elbow. Return when the tree breaks. Do not let it break you. The birch tree was not fully grown, but it was over twenty feet tall, with a trunk nearly six inches thick. Finn Vasili had struck the tree with his elbow till blood trickled between his scales. Then he switched elbows, then back. When night came, he slept beneath the tree, the same tree he was working to destroy. By the second night, both elbows were bloody, missing scales, and when he woke on the second morning, the ache of the previous day's training had not gone away. His shoulders and back were sore. He felt the devourer in his stomach, admonishing him for not having eaten, and the wooden core beneath the bark ran red with his blood. But he had risen and begun to strike again. Just before the third night, an even younger Finn arrived with a parcel of fish to sustain him. The next day, his progress was slower. Then his left elbow failed him. After one of his countless scything elbow strikes, he felt a snap. He could no longer straighten that arm and had to rely on his right. He switched yet again to even shorter sets, resting hours in between. Even lying down, the pain in both arms and in his right shoulder was constant, yet he fell asleep immediately, exhausted. 
on the fifth day, the tree broke. It had taken a week for a priestess to heal his elbow, even with the blessings of the goddess. Decades later, Finlord Vasili had returned. New growth had sprouted from the four-foot-high stump he had left. He chose a similar tree next to it and felled it. Scything elbow. Six strikes. Yesterday, he had found that first tree once more. The new bloom had grown into a full adult birch, forty feet tall and three times as thick as the old one. But the original broken stump could still be seen on the side, where the new tree had grown around it, consumed it. Deathfin Vasili struck the tree, scything elbow. The bark burst, and the pale brown core splintered. The mighty tree creaked and began to fall, a staccato cascade of branches snapping up above, its own and its neighbors. The tree's final counterattack. The monitor spun around, his foot lashing out in an arc above his head, knocking the birch trunk well clear of him, denying its vengeance. Uvira had discovered on her own how to teleport within herself and how to pass through her door this door. She had done so through untold hours of experimentation, through uncounted dead ends, known only to her, because only her success was recorded in that fault, and unlike the legendary Deathfin Tarun, she had done so without any hint, except her faith in her own power, and in the power of the blood of Blebal running through her veins. Surely, armed with her hints and her diagrams, as well as the certainty that what he sought was indeed possible. Surely he could match the feat which she had accomplished with none of these things. He stepped back and teleported into the wall again. He reached as far as he could into the stone beyond the shallow carved archway, thirteen or fourteen feet deep, before the astral force grabbed him and thrust him back into the hall. He grunted audibly in pain this time, allowing himself to lean forward against the cold stone, closing his eyes in a moment of fatigue. It grabbed me. Fazali's bulbous eyes flashed open, pupils unfocused, pocked with that handful of small cloudy lesions, the beginning of cataracts, which would surely plague his vision in the future. His mind was racing. The scroll of heavenly grasp! He stepped back once more, pausing, preparing himself. He had teleported three times already today. He could only use this power so many times in a row, even under normal circumstances. And right now the strain of constantly fighting that shunting force was wearing upon him. But suddenly, after years, he felt so close... This time, as he teleported ten feet forward, eight feet into the stone, when he felt that inexorable force grasp him, he didn't just resist against it as before. He tried to grab it back. This time, that pinching, stretching force was much worse. It felt like it lasted many seconds, though, in actuality, when the monitor stumbled away from Uvira's door, off balance, he knew that no time should have elapsed. Falling backwards, he twisted. He caught his weight on a single outstretched index finger. But then he felt a pain in his gut, doubling over and falling the last few inches to slump on the ground, and he suffered a coughing fit, blood dribbling off his lip, staining the ground in front of him. When the coughing passed, he grinned. A frightening crescent moon of teeth. Uvira had taken it for herself. Tarun had seized it. It will be mine. With one convulsive yet fluid movement, he sprung back to his feet, then forced himself to pause. This moment was to be savored, not rushed. He wanted it now. But there was no urgency, no need to rush, no reason to risk it until he was truly ready. Vasili sat back down, crossing his legs, and meditated. Had anyone happened into this lonely basement hallway at that time, 
they would have seen only the stillness of Vasili, and the silver deathfin symbol which adorned the back of his black jacket as he sat there. But deep within him he banished his impatience, which was uncharacteristically strong in this moment, his fear of failure or even of dying, which was weak but still very real. And he focused on his invulnerable will, his boundless confidence, and his fierce pride. These would be his weapons as he fought the cosmos itself for dominance. Once focused, Deathfin Vasili leaned over and pressed his left palm against the patch of blood that he had spat upon the floor beside him. Destiny, he rasped out loud. Shifting one foot, he pushed himself up from cross-legged to standing, using only a single leg. Settling into an aggressive stance, front arm straight out at shoulder level as though squaring up with a dangerous opponent, he opened that left fist, pointing his fingers straight up, the portentous blood facing Uvira's door. He breathed deeply, held it, then exhaled. Then he disappeared. Within the wall, he felt that fundamental power take hold of him, of whatever form of him existed in the space between spaces, in that fragment of null time. The universe took hold of him, and his will flared. He envisioned the droplets of the goddess within him, tiny, yet more precious, more powerful than the rest of his body and soul combined. He was a child of the storm, the devourer, the insatiable deity of blood and slaughter, and he would not leave without what he came for. He grasped the heavens, seized what was there, tearing off a small fragment of the astral, and as the force inevitably thrust him back out, this time the backlash launched him a good five feet. An electric purple aura washed explosively past him, following the contours of the doors and light fixtures as it dissipated down the length of the hallway. As he crashed down on his back, Vasili lay splayed out on the ground, a metallic taste in his mouth, bleeding from one nostril. His left hand was still outstretched, now far bloodier than before, blood from fresh lacerations pooling on the floor and trickling down his arm. He reached upward with that hand, pointing the shredded palm at the ceiling, and a crackling rectangle of that purple energy opened in the air above him. A portal. The Deathfin's throaty laughter echoed, roaring madly down the hall until, drawn by the cacophony, someone found him lying there, and they ran off to call for a healer.